folks, I'm super excited that we're hanging out together today. And I'm going to be sharing my first makes for 2023. In this video, we're going to go into a little bit more detail about that. And hey, so sewers, I'm super excited that we're hanging out together today. And Today, we're going to be talking about my January sewing plans. I'm going to go into the details about what I'm working on this week. And I've got a special guest, Jen Chenevert and Chenault. Sorry, I keep messing up your name. Anyway, Jen Chenault, who is my friend from college. Her name was different back then. And we are going to be um, talking about indie patterns. We're going to be talking about fabric and other fun sewing stuff that you do not want to miss. So without further ado, let me bring on Jen and here she is. Hi, Tony. Hey, Jen. I'm so excited that you're hanging out with me today. Me too. Hi, Sew Sewers. And so I think first I'm going to talk about like I built it up of to what my very first make is going to be. So let me switch the screen real quick and um, give me a sec. <laughs> so first thing we're going to do is tell you what I'm making first. And it is going to be this Vogue pattern here, which is love that pattern 1754. And I'm going to be making it in my lovely wool that I bought at Mood on my trip to New York. And as I was laying this out to cut it, I realized that this is Valentino. So it's also designer wool, which was super exciting. So ah! I'm, I know, I know, right? So I'm super excited about that. And um, I'm making it first because the days we have available to possibly have cold weather are getting shorter and shorter. So today, I think the high is 61, but not sure how long that's going to last. And I need to get this sewn up so that the next cold snap that comes through, I'll be ready to wear it. Because if I had it sewn, I would have been able to wear it this morning, but not yet. So, um, Jen, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Um, Jen Chenault and... Um, it's totally fine that you messed up my last name. I've only been married for a year, so it's it's new, and I just changed my name. So, um, but I am, always be Jen Smith to me. I am to a lot of people. So there you go. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited to be here. I've been following along and so um, inspired by what you're doing with So So Lounge, Tony. And so I love to be a supporter and. Hope I can add something, you know, um, I have to say when you pulled out that fabric as your first make, I was like, yes, it was one of my favorites from your haul. And um, I just think it's absolutely 100% you. It's, it's not surprising that it's Valentino. You know, it's beautiful quality in person, but the color and pattern are totally kind of what I think of when I think of your personal style. So I think that's a great choice for your first make. Thank you. So let's give a shout out to Lee and Louisa, who are both in um, the chat today. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And Jen, we've got a question for you. Where are you located? I am in Kingwood near Houston, Texas, the Burbs. Um, and I have been in, back in Texas for over 15 years now. And where were you before then, Jen? Yes, before that I was in, in New York City and um, went to college with Tony at the University of Texas for fashion design. Um, so my career took me out to New York and um, I did that for a while. I uh, worked for a couple of companies designing apparel, mostly tailored garments. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me in a nutshell. And I'm, uh, loving doing more sewing and getting back to that. It took me a few years after quitting the business to get back to it. So sewing is the best. It's like really one of the best hobbies to have because you can always, you know, 
come back to it after years of being gone. And it's like, you know, once you kind of learn the basic skills, you don't forget them, right? I mean, would you be in agreement yes. with that? I mean, like the learning part was hard back in the day when we were trying to figure yeah. it out and everything. But it seems to be that it's, it, you know, it's one of those things that has gotten a little bit easier with time. And like, I think the more mistakes that you make and learn from, then you know, the easier it gets. I mean, I won't say it's ever really easy. It's never super easy, but, you know, you kind of get to the point where you're like, okay, well, I know not to make that mistake again. So. Yes. Or you get, I mean, for me, I was completely impatient when I was younger. So in my twenties as a sewer, as a new sewer, um, I wanted everything to be, you know, quickly sewn up and for it to look perfectly finished um, but the truth is, is it takes lots of time and patience, especially as a new sewer to get those kinds of results. And um, I just kind of was ready to move on to the next thing. So um, age and time has given me the benefit of that patience and um, the ability to recut a garment if it's not going well. I'm doing that right now, you know, um, ripping out more seams. It's always seam ripping, isn't it? Like, I mean, that's, yes. I don't think you ever get past that because if you want to do it right, I think you have to say, okay, I'm committing to doing it right, which means I will recognize when I make these mistakes as in, you know, back in college, we were more like, we just have to get it done. Like I have to have something to turn in tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. So yes. Um, yes. that's something I think you kind of were like, okay, I'm not being graded anymore. I can handle this. Let me give a shout out to Linda Marie, who is watching from Ontario. Thanks for joining. So glad that you are here. And um, other thing I was going to talk about today is my other sewing plan. So I had basically thought that I would start with this wool cape that I, I talked about. If you missed it a little bit earlier, my very first project is going to be the Vogue cape. This is Vogue 1754. And I'm going to be making it from this gorgeous wool fabric made in Italy. Turns out it's Valentino. Super excited about that. And that's going to be the first project because we are limited in the amount of cold weather we're going to have in Texas. And hopefully there'll be a few more days next month so that, you know, I can actually wear it. Um, it's just, I mean, it's 60 something today, which is like a nice cool day, but that's not the usual. The other thing, and I don't know where I just put this. Um, oh, I knocked it on the floor. So I am going, the next project after I get this cut, cape sewn up is going to be the knit top from Made by Ray. And um, that's an indie pattern. It's my first indie pattern ever. And I am going to get it, start cutting it out. I printed it out. Um, if you miss what it looked like, you can check it out in this video. I'll put the link here. And then um, we will see how that goes. I'm going to be sewing with knits the first time. I mean, I've sewn with knits, but I've never sewn with like a pattern um, that is an indie pattern and knit. So fingers crossed it goes well. But um, Jen, what about you? Have you sewn with a lot of indie patterns? Because I think you've sewn with a lot more than I have personally. I have. I got really excited when kind of coming back to sewing a few years ago and realized how many indie pattern makers there were out there and just dove in. And I've really, I've learned a lot from that because I think um, when it comes to indie patterns, you have to, uh, or for me, um, I don't want to risk kind of wasting time, wasting great fabric. And so I've learned that it's really important to read reviews and see how many times the garment's been made up and it, to see photos, um, you know, because I absolutely trust a sketch on a Vogue pattern or McCall's. Um, but with indie pattern makers, you just don't know how, um, you know, how exacting they're going to be, how good their instructions are going to be. Um, and recently I had a big pitfall with that, um, a pattern you know, that's that a historical I, costume pattern too, right? It wasn't. Yes. Just, so let me, let me stop you for a sec. So Lee yeah. is asking what an indie pattern is. An indie pattern is an independent pattern. So it's made by, it's not made by one of the big four pattern companies. So not Vogue, McCall's, Butterick, Simplicity. I'll throw 
Berta in there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Berta, mm -hmm. I Berta. Berta. Yeah. I don't ever use those patterns. So I don't think about them. Those would be the, the, the main commercial patterns that you can go buy at any fabric store mm -hmm. anywhere, pretty much. And then independent patterns are pretty much everybody else who makes their own patterns, um, you know, and either sells them in PDF form or in PDF form and then combination, like you can order it from their website and then you can get the printed pattern in, um, in your hands. So let me give a shout out to Patricia, who's in Virginia. Hey, Patricia, thanks for joining us. And um, what are, I'm going to put a little banner down there so y'all can tell me what you think. Um, if anyone's sewn indie patterns, just let me know. And, um, and then we'll, we'll, We'll see what y'all think. If you if you've sewn with them, if you like them, if you don't like them, Jen, tell tell me more about this drama you had with the pattern. Well, well I will tell you that um, I was going to back up to those who are new to indie patterns. Um, one of the other things I would suggest, and I can also share this with you, Tony. Uh -huh. um, I read a couple of blog posts that were kind of um, indie pattern companies to know now. So it's sort of a round up of like top 20, top 10 indie pattern makers because um, I was mostly taking a look at Etsy for these and Pinterest. Mm -hmm. And so it's such a, it's a platform where everything kind of seems on the same level. So I needed an editor to share, you know, kind of what are, what are the good and proven um, names to know. So that's something I can share with you for oh, those. Who that sounds great. And I will in turn share it with all of y'all. Um, once I get that information, maybe we'll do an indie pattern roundup kind of later. I, I do want to start sewing with indie patterns this year. That is, that is definitely one of the new things I want to try. Um, if you missed out on the video from last week, which was all about my sewing plans and things that I want to do in 2023, um, I want to try new things. And I was talking to a friend of mine and he was suggesting that I have a theme for the year. And um, we were just joking about things. And he's like, adventures in sewing. So that is my theme for 2023, adventures in sewing. And trying independent patterns is, is one of those things. I'm starting with this Made by Ray pattern. I will um, put the info in the description below so you can check that out if you want. And then I'm also going to be using some patterns from some books that I've got. Um, I've got some Scandinavian pattern books and some Japanese ones, which I've been wanting to try for a long time. So this seems like the year to get that done. So that's that's part of it. And, and maybe once I try a few more, then Jen and I can do a pattern, indie pattern roundup. And Ooh, that sounds fun. I think that would be fun. Yes. Louisa likes indie patterns too. Cool. Hey, Louisa, let us know what your favorite one is. And if we've heard of that one before, uh, Jen sews with more of them than I do. So decent odds there. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to, to get new ideas from other sewers on these. Um, but I was going to share what you mentioned earlier. So this is my experience with um, a recent indie pattern. So I'm working on some costumes for, a play for my daughter's school and um, it's set in the thirties. And so the director of the play um, and I came together and she really had some very specific ideas and she found a, a dress that was for the lead. Um, and so I, I can share that here. So the style of the dress, oops, there we go. Okay. It's there we go. It's good. We can see. Oh, yeah. Um, the style of the dress has these kind of inset diamonds. When I saw this, I thought they were applique on. They're actually sort of a, you know, this is fullness control and built into the dress along with the welt pocket. Um, and so the, the dress is challenging. I mean, to me, this is a rather challenging dress overall. Um, and I just went into it trusting that it was all going to work out. Um, the instructions said they strongly suggested to make this up in muslin beforehand, which I normally do um, a prototype. So I've learned also a partial prototype is really, really helpful. It's not a full prototype for anything I sew now. So um, what do you do for a partial prototype? Like how much of the dress do you make at that point? 
Um, so there's an example I have here, actually another dress I, I made and it's behind me. This, uh, so this dress, that's a cute dress. You have, I've seen you wearing that and it's, yeah. it's here we go. I'm not used to the screen. So I everything covers. So I just really made up the bodice to sort of like the first tier here. Okay. And that was enough for me to understand how much fullness um, to expect and also to get the bodice fitted really well. I have kind of a small back and, um, I wanted to make sure the other thing that you and I have talked about, Tony, is that a lot of indie pattern makers don't include how much ease is built into the pattern. Yeah, that's for sure. And so the partial prototype or a full prototype really kind of helps with that. Um, and so, so yeah, I skipped that on this historical dress that I showed you and just went straight to the, you know, the real garment. Um, and I also bought the last of two. There's three, there are three fabrics in the dress. I bought the last of two of them at Joanne's. And so I proceeded to work on the dress and there were several things that I uh, found very challenging in addition to that. Um, the instructions left out uh, how to do the dress for one of the views. So one of the views has no band on the collar and no tie. And the instructions just weren't clear enough for me. And I may have missed something, but um, what I ended up doing actually after you and I talked was some pa pattern reworking mm -hmm. and sort of making it easier um, in terms of how it comes together. And I think it's going to look much more beautiful and finished and um just make more sense in every way yeah i mean it sounds like it's a flashback to our college days and having to do these these draping practicals with you know here's a vintage pattern here's a photocopy of a vintage pattern like let's clarify it was a black and white photocopy of a vintage <laughs> pattern and our professor was like okay <laughs> now part of your grade depends on this and you're kind of like it's a bad photocopy of a vintage pattern and I'm supposed to figure out how to drape this. And Jen and I both have like trauma associated with this. I'm sure probably at least half the class does. I know that the other half of the class, like they were the ones who got it right. And then like the rest of the on the other side. And, and just so y'all know, like this trauma is so real. We our professor, Dr. Rewartz, may she rest in peace. Mm -hmm. She would line it up from the best to the worst and mm -hmm. there would be like four different patterns and then she'd divide the class up so you know there would be like three of us in each group because I think there was about 12 of us and mm -hmm. then you know she'd like put a little piece of muslin around our name that was taped to the top of our dress form but like everybody <laughs> knew whose they were you know and so it was just traumatic I mean I know you agree with me on this I mean we we spent so much time working together I could have probably known which muslin was yours or mine from the way we pinned. Yes. I mean, it was, sure. I honestly, and, um, and I was last in line. I will confess. I was the very I end. Was too. Of the, I was too. Don't think and that. it felt really difficult, but you know, I think what was good about that is it did. Um, I think it drove home how, uh, challenging pattern making and draping can be. And, you know, these folks work hard for 15 years or more just to get sort of the chops to be a head pattern maker, you know. Um, and, and that's the and, reason I, I admire indie pattern makers, because if that's what you were doing as a full time job and a lot of people like I'm thinking yeah. of Pattern Scout, I don't know that she has like a huge I know that she does her own patterns and tests them out. And then, you know, I have not bought any of hers, but I do watch her videos and man, it's a lot of work to get it right. I mean, from just from, you know, when we would do it in college, like, I mean, one thing that I remember that I learned the hard way was when you make your patterns, you better true up all those lines and get those corners squared and, and make sure everything fits back together because I never did that. I just kind of was like, yeah, that's close enough. That's same mm -hmm. allowed, you know, and nothing ever lined up. And I didn't end up like trimming seams because like, you know, the back of the skirt would be longer than the front of the skirt. And I just, you know, trim it. I'm just, I mean, I still do that mm -hmm. a little bit, but not to that extent. But I mean, like props to indie indie designers who do this themselves and, you know, 
have either gone to school and gotten the training or learned it or I mean, I I'd, I'd love to be there one day. I don't know. I, I still think I would rely on a pattern maker to do it. Like I'll do the initial have a pattern maker so that way you know that it's done right and that you can be confident in your your product. Yeah, and I mean, I've I've heard I've never worked for I've never worked for a company that did this, but I have heard that some companies have sort of, you know, uh, more assistant level drapers and then those garment or those those muslins are then handed off to more senior pattern makers. Um so it totally makes sense kind of what you're saying and I I think you absolutely should do your own patterns. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to, to proponent. I am. I am. I'm a supporter. Yes. So, which I appreciate, yeah. but yeah. so what new things are you going to try? Like I'm going to try, what was I going to try? I was, I'm number one, number one, big thing other than just the general trying new things. The other big thing is to try to sew from my stash as much as possible because I have a lot of fabric. And the good thing is in the last two years, I've been buying fabric for specific patterns. So that's one of the reasons I'm starting with this Vogue cape with my fabric from Mood um, because I already know I have the exact amount of yardage that I need and I can just get started. I mean, I just had to cut out the pattern. And so some of the first projects that I was, I was planning on getting going at the beginning of the year were fabric from my stash that has a pattern and moving forward with that. I have several pieces from Mood actually, because I love, love, loved my fabric that I bought and had all these other plans in place for the rest of the year. So since I got everything in August, I didn't have a chance to sew a lot of that up. And then the seasons were kind of changing. So, you know, that was the other part, but you know, that's one of the things I'm doing. I would love to know what you are planning to sew this year, Jen, if you have anything in particular. But then also, I would love to know in the comments, if you're watching, if you have any big sewing plans this year and and what those would be. I, I mean, I was inspired. So I was inspired by your video and I love the idea of a theme for this year. Um, and so I kind of have two, two themes, I guess. Um, and you know, kind of, it's all really. I was thinking, well, why, why do I decide to sew rather than buy a garment? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, you know, novelty and kind of creating something that's really unique when I'm sewing now is important. Yeah. Um, you know, time is limited. I have three kids. I have you know all kinds of things happening. So. Um, so the idea of novelty and also I was inspired by this book, which, <laughs> so this book, it's fabulous. Tony, okay, here I go. Um, Tony gave me this book and it just has the most amazing dresses. It's the Met, uh, the costume Institute, um, at the Metropolitan Museum of Arts, um, you know, book on dresses. And I've always loved dresses because, in, especially in Texas, they're so easy to wear and just make so much sense. Um, and so, and also it's really a great way to get novelty in. Um, and it's a big departure from ki the kinds of things I was doing when I was working. And so, um, so that's my overarching theme. And then um, kind of along with that, I've been dyeing fabric for about three years. Um, and I'm, my goal is to create a few, uh, styles that include, um, my, my dyed fabrics. So my hand dyed that fabric. That is right. You have been doing, I have some silk that I think has your name on it, but I need, might need ah. to the dress that I want to make. So we'll see. I have to show it to you and, um, you'll have to let me know. But Linda Marie in the chat said that she's a pattern tester for several indie companies and they're not all created equal. Um, that some don't have instructions, they're missing instructions. <laughs> they they have fit problems and um, grammar and punctuation. So I have not had that experience. Like I said, this is Jade, the Jade pattern by Made by Ray is going to be my very first um, indie pattern to start with. So I will keep y'all posted. Jen, have you seen any of those problems? I mean, have you had that kind of issue or have you noticed it? Other than this crazy costume pattern that, you know, is a, a vintage, possibly a vintage reproduction, we don't know. 
Uh, yes, I have. And um, I, I actually tried something that was pretty challenging. I bought a French language um, pattern which was, uh, you know, and, and also uh, the European, um, so the, the fit that's a, sort of the norm in Europe is a little bit different than the American, um, I would say, body shape and ex expectations of fit and styling. Mm -hmm. um, their aesthetics are different. And the idea of this pattern was fabulous. I actually bought three from the same maker. Um, and when I made it up, it was just like a little less than fabulous. It just didn't kind of do what I thought it was going to do in terms of the way it looked on, on the body. Um, and so, so was that, it because the picture on the pattern looked different or was it an illustration? Like what, what, what was different from what you thought you were going to get? Like what about the pattern made it seem that way to you? Um, the fit sort of lacked, it lacked shape. Mm -hmm. It was very sort of straight and angular. And I think it was probably an inexperienced pattern maker. Okay. Um, and then, you know, that coupled with not really being able to fully understand, like I was using Google Translate um, to try and understand the directions. Um, so I would say that, that was uh, just a little less than... Um, it was just kind of a bad decision on my part, especially to go all in on three from the same maker. Okay. Um, but yeah, I would love to also hear, I guess, is it Lisa Marie? Or is it Linda Marie. Linda Marie. Um, kind of what, if she's got any ideas of great uh, brands for us to check out too. So um, would love to hear that. Right, leave that in the chat. Um, Linda Marie, if you, if you, if you feel up to it and you don't feel any pressure, uh, <laughs> yeah. to know. I know that Louisa, who also said she uses indie patterns, um, uses Cashmere, um, Love Notions, and Wardrobe by Me. I have heard of the first two. I have not heard of Wardrobe by Me. Have you used any of those patterns, Jen? I've seen Wardrobe by Me. I've also seen Made by Ray that you were talking about. Um, and there's kind of a, I don't know if I'd call it a trend, but I would say there are several brands that I've seen that do these kind of capsule lifestyle collections. Have you seen that, Tony? I, where... I've seen some other sewers on YouTube sewing with them where it's like, mm -hmm. we're going to try, we're going to do this. And it's like kind of like a capsule wardrobe from a specific pattern company. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and we, I used to see this um, in years back in the traditional pattern makers selections as well like a designer would have five easy pieces and it's like a brand new like wardrobe and the idea is that you could get rid of everything else and it's kind of that minimalist um approach and that appeals to me in a way but then mm -hmm. i think you know unless i can execute minimalist designs very very well um, I don't know that those are always the best choices for me. <laughs> I, you know, you got to have a novelty. You've got to have really straight seams. You got to, you got to, you know, not have any puckers. You got to press while you go. It's kind of one of those things where, you know, I, I like clean lines too. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I was kind of gravitating towards these um, Scandinavian pattern designers was because they have these really nice clean lines that, really can show off the fabric. And I love print. I love color. Um, I like big prints. And the best way to show that off is going to be in a garment that doesn't have a lot of seams, doesn't have a lot of, you know, um, just stuff added to it. So, I mean, you wouldn't want to use a really bold print with something that has princess seams and, you know, maybe pockets or like a gathered dropped waist. I mean, like the, you want to have the fewest interruption to the actual pattern of the fabric with your actual sewing pattern so that, that things can work together. And, and that's one reason why I gravitate towards also towards the Japanese designs, which are kind of like these sculptural oversized mm. um, patterns that are you know they're there's i mean japanese women are small women and like if you go look at these books these patterns are big and but i just there's something about wearing clothing that looks like sculpture that really appeals to the like the artist in me and i'm like oh i can mm. wear that to the art museum and i'd be so cool but you know that's that's definitely one of the things that i've 
I want to kind of move into to not just use my pattern stash, my fabric stash, but also to kind of just get some new experiences in pattern, you know, not necessarily making because I'm not making the pattern, but I'm copying the pattern. So um, that that's kind of what I was thinking for, for mm -hmm. this year. In my adventures in sewing, it would be fun to just kind of try some different things and and try some different shapes too. Like not just the standard, you know, commercial pattern, and I, I gravitate towards simplicity patterns because they're pretty easy. Um, and, you know, when I want to sew something, I want to sit down and I want to get it done. Um, so I don't want this super complicated. Sewing with Vogue is a whole nother new thing for me. But, um, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on that, Jen? I mean, how do you feel about when you pick patterns and want to use fabric that you've got and, and things like that? Well, I do. I mean, I keep in mind, like, what do I think I can execute well, mm -hmm. first and foremost? Um, you know, I'm not going to uh, select a heavy tailoring um, pattern right now. Um, I'm going to select something that's a little bit easier and faster. Um, but I was thinking, I do actually have one of the Japanese designs on my, uh, I have my board here with kind of what I'm planning. And um, you can see, I think you can see this kind of top with the, exaggerated sort of circular sleeve yeah i absolutely love that design and i hope that um that it's going to look as good on me as it does on her uh, that remains to be seen um but i do i it love great yeah i love that sculpture and and that could also this could care you know you could use this with a print mm -hmm. or a novelty fabric as well yeah. because it's simple enough um so I'm definitely interested in making dresses this year. Um, this is kind of my spring uh, things that I'm going to be working on. I recognize um, some of those fabrics from our, our trip too. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Um, but it's nice because I feel now that more than ever, I think I understand what I look good in and what feels good to wear. And then kind of marrying that back to where my ability is um, and maximizing impact with novelty. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. No, I think that's one thing that that sewers with more experience, I won't say not necessarily experience, but like age. I think age helps you realize what you look good in and helps you become comfortable with your body so that you you were like, okay, I can wear this. You know, I've always been very outlandish. I'm so have you. I mean, like when I when I met Jen, the very first day I met Jen, we were walking down the sidewalk on campus, and she was wearing this sleeveless blue fur, like kind of midriff top with low rise jeans, and. Um, I don't know. I just had it. Her hair was all piled up. It was all messy, piled up on top of her head. And we just kind of started chatting and we realized not only were we going to the same building, but we were going to the same class. And I was so excited because I was like, oh, this cool girl is talking to me <laughs> and she is going to know what she's doing and sewing. And Jen constantly refers to herself as a hack right now. But we <laughs> We sat next to each other in our in our class on the very first day of school, and I was like, "We are going to be friends." And I was so excited. Uh, and I know, and it was I it was an awesome. I ever saw you in jeans too, because the other thing about Jen is that Jen is a dress girl. She mm -hmm. loves to dress. She's like one of the few people that I know who wore dresses almost every day in college. Like, <laughs> seriously, like. I, I was I was the girl in jeans or shorts or skirts or whatever. Like I was constantly changing my look, but you have been a dress girl from like, other than that very first time I met you when you were wearing jeans, like I don't think I ever saw you in jeans again. Yeah. And I, I mean, like I said, it makes a lot of sense. And it's, um, I think that, you know, dresses are, it's sort of, you know, a chance to express your femininity in some ways. Um, and that feels right for me now. Um, but yeah, I, I do love a dress. There is no doubt. That is absolutely true. And I love a shirt dress, um, which not everybody does. But I absolutely, I mean, I've got probably 
at least six or seven shirt dresses in my closet right now. Um, and I don't, my closet is not jam packed. So, um, that's a high number. And I think that, um, I actually bought this, uh, this pattern, which I'm trying, I don't think I have a number on here, but it is sort of, let's see. Let this one, one, no, this one. Okay. So this one here is, I think going to be the perfect dress. I did a prototype of it. And then there are several sort of variations on it. Um, I'm going to make it up in this paisley. Also this um, kind of pastel uh, faux plaid. That's a Chanel fabric. So that's kind of exciting. Um, and these are purchased at um, Universal Fabric in uh, Houston. She has a wonderful selection. She's not online. You have to dig through things. But I think this the best part very, very much digging through things. It's probably the closest New York fabric store shopping experience you can get outside of New York. Now, I've not been to Mood in Miami or L.A., but for, for this region of the country down here in Texas, um, have it, I went there first and then I went to New York and I was like, oh, yeah, Jen was right. It is totally like a New York experience because yeah. just you got to go dig. you got to find it. There's there's not really a lot of rhyme or reason. So back to what we were talking about earlier, um, Linda Marie popped in and said that she agrees with the three choices of the earlier um patterns, which were Cashmerette, Love Notions, and Wardrobe by Me. And she also likes Tilly and the Buttons, and it should be five out of four patterns, Blank Slate by Hand London. Here's some more um, closet core I have heard of. I know Tilly and the Buttons. Wow. I just follow her on Instagram. Um, it's not really my style, but I do have her books because I, I just love how poppy, like she's just so positive and British and I just love it. I love the way she writes sewing books. So I have read all of those. So thank you, Linda Marie for that insight. We appreciate those. Um, and then Yeah, I've looked at several of those. Deer and Doe, who I think was kind of next on that list, yeah. is really good. I haven't used it yet, but I have them bookmarked for the future. Closet Core is kind of one of those that... Um, I've, I've heard of that when a lot of people sew with that um, on various YouTube yeah. channels. Yeah. And so definitely, I just, my style tends to be like Jen, we, you know, we started designing in the nineties and that's kind of our, there was, that was like the minimal aesthetic. I mean, there was a lot, yeah. of that, but I think that we kind of, and I also think our sewing skills <laughs> and pattern making skills lent themselves to minimalist patterns. <laughs> just anyway. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, and I hope to take more chances now um than I did back then but um but certainly it was I think a lot of uh what I'm looking to do now is maybe a reaction to that even because um you know companies that I worked for were very tailored and serious so um so I'm looking for more fun in this experience now well, and I think that now you we we've, we've both got more time to and space. You know, I mean, I don't know about you, but like in college, mm -hmm. I had my sewing table set up in my bedroom. Um, you know, and I'd use the dining table to cut things out if I couldn't do it yeah. um, in class. And so I think that now that you know we have our own houses, you have your own space. Um, I think that's something about being you know, a little bit older and, and just being able to control your environment and how much space you have and how much space in your house you want to dedicate to your sewing room. I think that that makes a huge difference too. I have to say my husband came up with the idea to build a Murphy table in the garage. Nice. Uh, and I got to spec out um, how high it will be. So I'm going to do a standing height, um, fold down table. And it kind of, it, it sort of, um, it doesn't just come straight down. It kind of cantilevers. Um, and it's going to be big enough for me to, to uh, cut plenty of uh, patterns. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, and that's, I'm, that's always having, having a surface that you don't have to like dining room tables are some of the very, very worst things to have to, to cut on because yeah. I mean, it kills your back you can potentially scratch the table. Like I remember when I lived with my grandma and I, I had to put a sheet over the table to not scratch the table. And then it would take me forever to cut because I had to 
you know, not scratch the table with my scissors. And mm. uh, I think grandma's watching. So hi, grandma. I'm glad you tuned in for the live stream today. And I'm sure you remember putting the sheet on that table. So I did not scratch it. But, um, you know, I think that's one of the things that's like being able to have that table. Like I have a cutting table in my sewing room, which could be a little bit higher and a little less wobbly. So one day I will upgrade to a custom table. But, you know, it's still so much better than what I had back in the day. So. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's nice to have uh, have the ability to, to make things work for you a little bit more. Um, and yeah. I'm definitely appreciative of my husband kind of supporting me in that he supported me in uh, fabric dyeing as well and sometimes participates, which is so fun. So yeah, it's good stuff. That's, that's really cool. So when did you, um, so just in case y'all missed it at the beginning of the live stream, Jen and I went to college together. She went off to New York and was a fashion designer and I, did post around and bid did uh um you know did other things eventually went to law school she stayed fashion designer and um so how did law you, school it's like yeah <laughs> law school yeah i'm my being a day job is my lawyer i'm a lawyer is my day job this is my real passion so this is why i'm here hanging out with jen and hanging out with all of you today um hey stephanie um, I see Stephanie said that she's a beginner. How do people cut on the floor? I don't know. I have always had carpet. So cutting on the floor was never really a viable option for me. Um, Jen, I you... still cut on the floor. Okay. Um, so if it's a really long layout and I don't want to have to reposition the fabric because, you know, getting things on grain takes time. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you use the floor, you can lay the whole length of the fabric that you're using out and not have to sort of readjust and um, make sure you're on grain or the fold is correct and that sort of thing. I, I like cutting on the floor in my sewing studio also because there's not a whole lot of foot traffic up here. So it's like, <laughs> it's almost like a table so I can lay the fabric out and not get too nervous about it. Um, but yeah, I, I don't mind it. And I also feel, um, you know, when you lay pattern, uh, fabric out on the floor, you can really kind of see what's going on. So if you've got a print or if you have, um, you know, something else that needs to be matched, like a plaid, it can be helpful to get uh, some perspective, like a more of a bird's eye view on things. So for me, uh, cutting on the floor is great, but I do definitely suggest that you use a wood floor or tile floor for that because um, cutting on carpet is just so wrong. Idea. It's a bad idea. An expensive I, way. <laughs> an expensive way to do things. I mean, and then I've got, I've got pets. And so, you know, it would just be a never ending. I mean, and as it is, it's almost impossible to keep Clementine off of the cutting table. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm cutting and it's like, it was funny because I, I had my fabric laid out and, um, and it just didn't, I mean, like she keeps getting on it. I keep getting off. It's wool. I've given up. I just can't get her to stay off. <laughs> um, but like putting it on the floor between her and honey. And even if I vacuum, it's like the, that the pet hair just gets into the carpet and then like, oh, there's fabric. Let's come back out. So that would just not work for me. I have, um, I think my table's about seven feet long and it's about three feet wide. And it's one of those fold up ones. I got it at Joanne's um, when it was on sale at some point. I think they still have a similar model. And um, so um, that's that's what I use. And then when I have a, a layout that's a longer layout, I lay it out so that the, you know, like right now I'm cutting the cape. I'm finishing cutting the cape and it's, it's a single layout and my fabric is 60 inches wide. So I have my fabric along the length of my table. So I can't cut very, I can only cut about three feet at a time, but um, I kind of hold the other side of the fabric or prop it up on like a TV tray or something so that it's not pulling it off the table and I'll cut what's on the right. table first and then, um, you know, reposition the fabric and move it back up the fabric. And, that's that seems to be working right now. So I'm happy about that. I have like the first part of it, first section cut. 
Um, one thing that I have learned about this gorgeous wool that I am making my first make with the belted cape from Vogue is that it ravels across the bottom. So not on the selvage side, so it's raveling across the weft, which is the grain of the fabric that moves from right to left. And I need to go and surge all the seams or all the edges so that it doesn't continue to ravel while I'm working with it. So that's another wrench that I was not planning on being able to do. Um, and I, that's just another step. So I've got the first set laid out and cut. And now that I have to like take the pattern pieces off, I'm like, I'm going to get everything surged and then take off the pattern pieces and go cut the next layer. Cause that way I don't have to do it all at once. I can kind of go in stages. And that's generally how I like to work um, with getting everything cut out first and then moving on to the sewing all in one swoop. But this seam finishing is gonna have to be put in there at the very beginning this time around just to accommodate the fabric, so. That's like another industry thing that sort of um, missed the uh, home sewing market, I think. Um, you know, finishing all your, um, you know, doing your edge finishes first is just something that kind of, when it can be done, now it can't always be done, but when it can be done, it makes things cleaner and um, kind of maintains the integrity of the shape of the pattern pieces as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things that, that commercially they do is finishing the seams before construction a lot of the time, not all the time. One thing I'm realizing, and I don't know if you've had this experience, is anyone who's watching have this experience, let me know in the chat. Um, one thing I'm realizing is like, I started really sewing very regularly um, back in 2020, I lost my job. I decided I was going to start putting more time and effort into So So Lounge. And so I started sewing a lot more. And I never really thought that much about finishing seams. We didn't really talk about it much when we were in college. Um, you know, our garments that we made for our projects, they didn't need to have seams that were finished. And, you know, it was kind of one of those things where I just didn't think about it. And because I was always short on time making things like, finishing the night before something was due. I didn't think about it. And it's really only been since 2020. And I started doing this very regularly, that now I'll go back and look at my older makes and be like, why didn't I finish those seams? Like, what was I thinking? I totally forgot to do it. And so that's one of the things that I'm more consciously doing now is, okay, how is this going to be finished? And what's the best way to finish it? now because I have a serger now. Yeah, it's kind of a pain to rethread, but it's not, you know, super time prohibitive or anything. And it's going to make my garment look so much nicer <laughs> once I go and wear it. And down the road, when I come back and I look at it, I'm like, oh, look how pretty the inside looks. And I still have a few things that I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't finish those seams, but I just didn't. So, um, you know, Jen, what about you? I mean, what do you think? Do you have you kind of gotten more in in your experience and as you've gotten older and had more time to sew? Um, well, OK, I'll, I'm going to tell on myself here. So I have always cut corners and I I'm saying finishing seems what I mean is edge finishing. Right. Um, so but I've, I've cut corners in the past and um, I bought a Bernina a couple years ago. And it's got a ton of stitches. And so what I'll usually do is find a way to finish off the edges using one of the, the, the stitches that's offered. Right. Um, and I don't have a separate serger. But I've been thinking more and more about how nice that might be. What brand is your serger, it's Tony? A, it's a Juki by Janome. Okay. I got it when yeah. I got it back in the day when Hancock's fabric was still a thing. Um, it yeah. was right when I it was during law when I was in law school, like I was up there for Halloween fabric or something, and it was on sale for like a hundred dollars. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to buy it. So oh, I have, to, I have cool. to pull Linda Marie out of the comments right here. And she said that that she, they've all used pinking shears back in the day. Um, you're just a little older than us, Jennifer. Uh Linda, not not very much. Um, I'm older than you too, Tony, though. <laughs> not by much. Not by much. So Linda Marie was just saying she's pinking shears. 
I have never had a lot of success. And that's what they told us to use when we were in college. Like just use pinking shears. Like Dr. Craig, I remember was like the big proponent of pinking shears. But, um, oh, and Patricia is also saying that when she learned to sew in home ec, they all use pinking shears. Our professors in college told us to use pinking shears. My problem with pinking shears was that it didn't work. Like, I don't know if the fabrics that they used to use had a tighter weave than they do now. I mean, I know that fabric, there used to be a lot more options in fabric and, um, you know, everything else. I know Stephanie, Stephanie just said that I'm dating myself with Hancock fabrics. Jen can too. Didn't you work at Hancock's? I worked at Hancock yeah, fabrics. I college. In but Austin, Texas. Texas. They worked for me. Did they work for you, Jen? I mean, like, I literally have my pinking shears. I can reach over and get them. I have these pinking shears. They are Ginger pinking shears. My grandma got them for me when I was in college. They have always been very stiff. They have not been very easy. It's fine if you're using cotton. So when I've done samples of seam finishes and, you know, use like just a basic, you know, plain weave cotton broadcloth or, you know, poplin or something like that totally works fine. Not a problem, but anything thicker than that, I have just always had a challenge with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, now I, I will say, I think something like a wool Jersey, which I mean, in Texas doesn't really make sense most of the time, but, um, but a Jersey is a good fit for pinking shears in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, I have also had trouble lining up the pinking shear and making it look continuous that that is a huge problem mine it gets kind of chompy so like mm. I'll, I'll get the first line um oh so louise is saying she also learned to use pinking shears did they teach y'all can y'all let me know in the comments if they taught y'all how to have a nice continuous line where all of your pinks line up so it doesn't look like it like got chewed in the middle because i have never been able to make that look right um, I will, I got a great tip, uh, from a friend years ago about cutting in general. And I think this might carry over to pinking shears if you were really careful. Um, but the, the tip, the, the tip was to never close the scissor all the way. So leave about a quarter still open when you're cutting. And then when, and it does create a more, elegant line and you don't get as many little, you know, jig, you know, jig jags on there. Um, and I would say that probably carries over to pinking shears, but I just have never been able to make it look good. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Cause like, I mean, these pinking shears are not super long and if you only cut, I mean, you would, it would take forever to to do that, to finish. Yeah, it slows you down. That's the whole thing. There's, about no, there's no pinking little things here to get it open. That's you'd have to like stop about right here. And that just seems like that just would not work very well. But ladies, mm -hmm. if, if you have a tip for that, please let me know in the comments, um, either in the chat or below. If you watch this on the replay, I, I, Jen and I, neither of us have had success, even though that's what we were taught to do. Um, I think surgeries were still kind of new when we were in college. I mean, I remember they had them, but nobody ever really used them, right? I had a cheap one that I bought. Actually, I think I bought it at Hancock, and it was it was inexpensive. It was not a Janome or Juki. Um, I mean, those are those are great brands. Um, uh, and I, I'm not sure what the brand was, but it was just not good. Um, and so the threading was problematic and I ended up just leaving it on the side of the street when I moved from one apartment to another. So <laughs> it was sort of like, yeah, this is pretty useless, but um, perhaps it was user error as well. So that could have been the case. You just never know. So Louisa said that um, she has the same table that I do, which she got at Hancock Fabrics. So um yeah, that's, that's mine was, I, I'm pretty sure mine was from, um, uh, Joanne's because I, I remember I bought it, um, back when I was married and Hancock's had already closed at that point, shed a tear. Mm -hmm. because I loved Hancock fabrics. They had the best prices, but unfortunately, um, they brought in too much junk like all that decorator junk that they like then filled up half the store and ruined the whole business in my opinion so yeah we're gonna have to see what happens with joanne they're going through a transition as well which i think you covered on another um 
on your store closing episode, but, um, but yeah, we'll have to see what happens there for sure. Tony, I think we may have lost you. Well, I am not sure if I am live anymore, but I will show off a couple of things I'm going to sew that I just finished dyeing. So I have a silk rayon velvet that I created a pattern, a print for, and I'm super excited to start working with this. Um, I don't have much experience with velvet, and so this was kind of um, something new for me. And I was also using a new uh, dyeing technique. On this, so I'm excited about that. Um, and then I have another one that I created that I'm going to embellish. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a marbled look. It's also silk and rayon velvet, um, which I purchased at Dharma Trading. Um, and then dyed with the DuPont dyes. Um, and this little guy here, which is a little bit more dramatic in darker color. I was inspired by some uh, things I bought it while I was in France this past summer. Um, a little kind of velvet tank with uh, metallic le leather binding. And so I'm going to try and do some simple little tanks out of these. So I'm excited about that. Oh, I see. Okay, so Tony is going to be logging back and she lost connectivity for a while. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear what others are working on as well. I can't see it. Um, I don't think I can see. Oh, wait, I can. Yay, there we go. Oh, good. Okay, good, good, good. Here we go. Oh, thank you for saying that, Patricia. Um, yeah, the, the fabric dyeing thing has been really fun. And, um, you know, it's it's uh, messy. It also takes a lot of kind of water, which doesn't always make me feel like I'm the most um, sort of uh, responsible citizen, but um, but I try and, and get by with as little as I can in terms of resources. Um, but it's been so much fun because I really found out that I love working with silk. Um, and that's primarily what I dye. Um, so yes. And I'm excited to start sewing these up tomorrow. I'm about to go on another haul and purchase some fabrics. And I think I'm going to get combinations. I'm probably going to do some, um, like I'll probably do a little uh, tank, a simple tank out of this and possibly um, get a combination fabric for the back and just use this for the front um, because these are smaller pieces. I just wasn't ready to invest in a, a lot of yardage. Oh, 
Oh, Stephanie mentioned notching. So that's something I wanted to ask everybody about and hopefully get some feedback on. I have not seen a notcher for sale. Has anybody seen sort of one of the little just um, handheld notchers. I've seen them back when I was in the industry. Um, I think there's a place in New York where I might be able to purchase one. Hi. Oh my gosh. Thank you for holding down the fort. I'm so sorry. Like of all the time for my internet to just blitz out, it was like right in the middle of the live stream. So thankfully oh. I'm in the stream yard, which kept recording and kept Jen on. Thank you, Jen, for Yay. because this was very embarrassing. So Patricia C has um, said, tell, told you that you were still live. Um, and yeah. um, that was Louisa. And then Patricia was asking if you were showing a stretch velvet fabric. It's not stretch. Um, so they're uh, just, you know, regular kind of standard stationary woven um, velvet. And what's interesting is it's a combination of silk let me, and- Let me zoom in back on you. There we go, see if people can see it. Oh, that's yeah. so It's silk, I have such a problem. Okay, here we go. Um, it's silk and, and, and rayon, and the dye that I use only really works with silk. Um, and there's a steaming process to set the dye and make it color fast. And so what's interesting is like, you know, part of it gets dyed and then part of it doesn't. So I'm, trying to figure out if the pile has more um, rayon or if it's the ground that has more rayon. Now explain to people what that means for those who don't know the difference between pile and ground. Yeah, so the ground would be kind of the back of velvet. Um, it, it's actually, you know, obviously it's the foundation, but you can see it on the back um, where there's no kind of silky cut pile. And um, the front, which has a nap, you know, meaning direction um, is where the pile is. And I'm not actually sure if velvet is always made this way anymore, but originally the way that velvet was made was like a sandwich. Mm -hmm. And so um, there would be two uh, ground fabrics and then between them, uh, all of these beautiful, very silky, um, lustrous pile yarns. And then they would cut between the two ground fabrics and it would create um, the cut, what they called cut velvet. I'm not 100% sure that's how this is done now, but um, that's kind of the history and the, the way that, that velvet is constructed using a, a ground and then um, a pile yarn. Yeah, no, it's fascinating when you start learning about textiles and all of that kind of stuff. And velvet's one of those interesting things. And I'm, I'm with you. I don't know if they still make it that way, because when you make it that way, you'd have like, you know, double whatever amount of yardage you were weaving, because once you cut it in the middle, then you've got, you know, two separate pieces. And then a lot of velvets today, like, I'm wondering if, like, I don't know if you've used any velvets that kind of start falling apart. So like, it's, it's not quite as tight of a weave. And then you're like, well, was there like the pile that went into the other fabric, like on the other side when it was the sandwich that made it tighter for them when they cut it, as opposed to now it's just like these little loose threads going up there. Like, I don't know. I think this is actually more what you're talking about because I don't know if you can see it, but there are fibers kind of floating around when I wave it. Um, and I did tear this, uh, tear the edge, which I love to tear edges. I do. <laughs> My favorite and tear off salvages. So I do that. But um, I think that this is one of those made more cheaply. I have a piece of vintage velvet that is very tight, very um, sort of, uh, I, I, it has more body mm -hmm. in the ground and it also has more body in the pile. The pile yarns are very close together and it is one of the finest pieces of fabric. I'll, I think I'll keep it to the day I die. Um, and it was given to me by a family member who, uh, or makes these dresses for debutantes that have these long trains. Um, and so she does kind of couture work. Um, but it's very, you know, it's a definitely a different uh, level of quality. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, anything else you want to share? I, the whole, the whole dropping out has, has kind of thrown me off 
kilter a little bit. So thank you for picking up the slack. Well, I'm going to hold you to that Valentino beautiful uh, cape because I cannot wait to see that. I know. I really like this morning. It was I think it was like 50 when I went to court and I was like, man, if I had my cape, I could have totally worn. I wore a black wool coat instead. But it's like, man, I could have totally worn that to court. And so I really need to get it sewn up in the next, you know, this coming week so that I, I will have it ready to go for the next cold snap, which I think is possible since we're just in January. I think we could get a couple, at least one more cold snap in February. It's Not older three. over the next couple of days, I've heard. So yeah, so we'll I don't think I can get it made that fast. But yeah. Anyway, so um, we have enjoyed hanging out with you guys today. Thank you so much for for being a part of this live stream adventure. And um, you know, I I've. Love being able to chat with you guys. Apologies for the technical difficulties. I will have a plan B. I'll have a another link on my phone so I can switch over. I, I was not prepared for that this time. Um, my internet has been very, very good and I've not had these problems. So thank you so much for watching. I'm going to be doing more of these live streams um, every month. So be sure to keep an eye out in the community tab and, you know, be sure to click the bell so that you'll be notified of any live streams and when they're going to happen. I've enjoyed having you here and chatting with you all today. So until next time, happy sewing.